Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for coming today and, and for dealing with your fears of the virus and coming here to listen to this talk on the March 1st movement. Now, the, the March 1st movement was the largest uprising against the Japanese during the colonial period. And as is virtually known to all South Koreans, on the day of March 1st, 1919, a group of 33 leaders get, uh, proclaimed Korea's independence from Japan as peaceful protests were held in several cities. You can hear, they were in a, they were at, the, the leaders actually gathered in a Chinese restaurant called Tewagwan. You can see right there. Right? Then th it was read out loud in Pagoda Park in Jongno, where, where people were gathered. Right? Why would people, why would nationalists concerned about the independence of Korea gather in a Chinese restaurant you know, to celebrate? It's because they, they knew they were going to turn themselves into the police right after it started. So they knew the police would come. They didn't want to uh, start a, a riot. So they deliberately went someplace separate so that it wouldn't cause a disturbance. Right. Now, so this event is commonly regarded as one of the most important events and most important turning points of modern Korean history. Now, you know that, and you can see the protest. This is the, the wall you see, that's Doksugung, Doksu Palace. This is near where City Hall is right now. Now, there are two ways we can tell that how important the March 1st movement is to the South Korean people. First is, uh, it has been consecrated as a national holiday in South Korea. In fact, it was the first national holiday created in South Korea. In fact, it, it, they started commemorating it before South Korea was even officially launched in 1948. Now, it was first designated a holiday in 1946 when Korea was still under American occupation. Then it was continued every year after that. Now, South Korea is one of the very few countries in the world that has actually two ho national holidays dedicated to its independence. So it celebrates the proclamation of its independence on March 1st and the actual achievement of its independence on August 15th. Right. Now, second, the importance of the movement has been consecrated in the very constitution of South Korea. Now, the current constitution that's passed in 1987 simply states that the people of Korea uphold the cause of the provisional republic of Korea government, born of the March 1st independence movement of 1919. See it down here. Right. So sort of indirect. Yeah. But the very first constitution that was created in July 1948 made an even more direct connection to the March 1st movement. It says here that the Republic of Korea started not in 1948, but in 1919 with the March 1st movement. Right. It says it directly in the preamble to the first uh, constitution. So this shows that the South Korean government takes its legitimacy from anti-colonial nationalism as embodied in the March 1st movement. So this makes it important for South Koreans to know. South Koreans feel that they have to know this. But then why is it important for other people to know about it? Now, to a historian, this official version of, of the event does not fully do justice to its historical importance. You know, though it's undeniable that the movement was a crucial moment in the development of Korean nationalism, there's much more that can be learned from it, especially by people who are you know, not in Korea, not in South Korea. And this becomes uh, clearer if you compare it to the May 4th movement in China. Now, the way people talk about it, it seems that the May 4th movement in China was much larger than the March 1st movement. Right? They talk about uh, the March May 4th generation that was transformed by that. You know, any uh, literary figure who emerged at, at that time is called the May 4th writer. You know, Koreans don't do that. But in actuality, the March 1st movement was a much larger movement. And it was much more upsetting to the Japanese. So more recently, Koreans have been trying to expand the scope of the movement. And there have been efforts to examine the context of the movement more broadly, you know, both domestically and internationally. Now, last year was the 100th anniversary of the, of the movement, as, as you know. And at this time, you know, several people, from, you know, from politicians to academics, proposed changing the name of the movement to the March 1st Revolution. This view has been gaining you know, some momentum among the general population as well. Here you see some politicians 
uh, deciding to cover it. But according to a, a public opinion survey, now 49.4% of the South Korean population support the idea of changing its name. But as you can see, 38.8 are, are opposed. Now, whether or not one agrees that it was a revolution, s such work has been valuable in providing a wider historical uh, perspective on the movement. So in today's lecture, I will discuss the legacies of the March 1st movement, uh, aspects of which are only important with the broader historical uh, perspective. But first, uh, and I'll talk about these three aspects of the movement. But first, let's go over some of the basics of the movement. Now, where did the movement start? It seems that it started with the discussions abroad. You know, there were many Korean activists living abroad in Japan and China, of course. You know, students in, in Japan and activists in China. Then, after the end of World War I, they decided to sort of try to go to Versailles to press for the peace conference, to sort of try to press for Korea's independence. But of course, uh, this was a problem because uh, not only was Korea a colony, but there was no official body that could send a delegation to the Versailles Peace Treaty. So activists there quickly formed what was called the New Korean Young Men's Association to sort of act as the sponsoring body. And they decided to send Kim Gyushik to Paris. But uh, because of the various difficulties that they had, they also thought about starting a domestic movement. Students in Japan had a similar idea. And they also uh, prepared a separate Declaration of Independence that was read in February 8th, 1919. Yeah. Then they made connections with uh, a, a, a nativist religion called Chondogyo, which was descended from Donghak. They got them to provide the funding to send Kim Yushik to Paris and also to fund the domestic movement. Now, the first thing to sort of understand, the first sort of misunderstanding to sort of address is the fact that is the name, March 1st Movement. It's a bit of a misnomer because uh, the protest did not end on that day. It was not a single day event. It was just the beginning. And in fact, the movement can be seen as a two-stage event. You know, so it, it, protests initially occurred in, large, in the cities and large towns. But then they catalyzed protests in the countryside. Then when the Japanese tried to suppress these mo movements, it erupted into a violent uprising. So what was often happened is that a student would go home for vacation or, uh, or deliberately go to their hometown, bringing copies of the Declaration of Independence. Then on a market day, when, pe when lots of people would be gathered in a single location, they would read it out loud and then begin protests against the Japanese. Then when the Japanese would fire on them or try to suppress them or arrest them, then the farmers would gather, in fact, in fact primitive, the, the simple farm implements, and then attack armed police stations afterwards. And this continued into the summer months. Right. Now, estimates on the number of participants varies wide, widely, right. anywhere from half a million to two million. Like, if you hear anyone from the government talk about the movement, any official sort of version of the movement, they always say two million people participate. Right? This is not an inaccurate number. It's uh, uh, statistics will show that there were 200, 2 million total people involved, but that doesn't count people who went to more than one protest. So they were repeat attendees. So the number of people who actually attended is probably a little less than one million. But considering the fact that the population of Korea at the time was about 15 to 17 million, this is an incredibly still high proportion of the population that was involved in the movement. If you think back to the recent candlelight protests in 2016, you know, there were about a million people gathered in Seoul, and that was considered large. So again, back you know, 100 years ago, they had a million people involved in the movement. The total number of incidents is about 1,200, and it has a relatively high you know, proportion of violent incidents. This is not surprising because, again, the Japanese were completely taken by surprise, and they tended to react in a very violent manner. Now, among them were some very, uh, and you can see this is, these are the Japanese reports that show the st statistics of it. Now, and eventually, you can see that the movement did occur 
all over the country. The larger dots are ones where, again, uh, where they had at least uh, 1,000 participants in a protest. Now, we've seen some brutal massacres. Like about 10 years ago, uh, the diary of a Japanese military commander was discovered. And in it, it revealed that they did, as many people have suspected, they had indeed uh, co conducted a massacre at a church in Jeomni in Gyeonggi province, where they shut the protesters in a church and you know, set it on fire. So all these things have, have come out. Uh, stories of massacres are still coming to come out to this day. But these statistics are sufficient to show that the March 1st movement was much more than a movement. It really was a broad-based uprising against Japanese rule. Now, the first and perhaps most obvious legacy of the March 1st movement is the rise of civil society. You know, the movement was the moment that the strength of civil, Korean civil society became apparent for the first time. Right? And now, you know, as is well known, this is a major theme of modern Korean history. Many of the major events of modern Korean history are due to, to the, again, resistance of civil society against oppression, whether it was the Japanese or military dictatorship. From the, you know, March 1st movement to the April 19th revolution of 1960, to the Gwangju uprising in 1980, to the democratic you know, uprising in 1987. Right? And the most recent manifestation of, of its legacy is, of course, the candlelight protests. And many commentators at the time made the connection very directly. In fact, one of the reasons why there's a push to call the March 1st movement a rev revolution is because people be began calling the candlelight protests the candlelight revolution. So they said that if that's a revolution, then the March 1st movement should also be considered a revolution. Now, the emergence of civil society, society was very rapid in Korea. Yeah. Those of you who might know, the, 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 the word society did not exist in Korean until the late 19th century. You know, Neo you know, society, the Neo-Confucian order does not have what we would call a society. In fact, the Chinese characters for society are made of two characters that have very negative connotations in the, in the uh, classical Chinese times. So the first time it was used was in 1896. Right? So again, from that time, when the word was even first used in 1896, to about you know, barely you know, 25 years later, a dynamic, strong civil society emerged in Korea. So how did this happen? It was mainly due to two main institutions, religion and education. Right? When I talk about religion, I'm talking about the two new religions that emerged in the 19th century, which is Christianity, or, or, um, and I mean more Protestant Christianity, because ca Catholicism has, has a longer history in Korea. And then Chondogyo, which people might be less familiar with. But again, it literally means uh, the religion of the heavenly way, but it's descended from Donghak, the Donghak religion. The characters for Donghak mean Eastern learning. And that's because it was uh, formed in direct opposition to the rise of Catholic, the spread of Catholicism in Korea in the 19th century, which was Catholicism was translated as Western learning. So it was a very much a syncretic, nativist religion. You can tell how nationalist and nativist it is by the fact that it's one of the few religions actually officially recognized by North Korea even today. Now, at this time, people think about it today, they think that the Christians were, Christianity was larger than Chondogyo. And in fact, if you look at the signers of the Declaration of Independence, about even numbers of Chondogyo figures and Christians, but in actuality, Chondogyo was a far larger religion than Christianity. Christianity was more of a local, very urban, regional religion. Chondogyo was nationwide. Right. So Chondogyo handled organization in the countryside, in rural areas where 80% of the population was located. Christianity handled urban areas. But since Christianity was still building up, it didn't have much money. So the funding for the movement came almost entirely from Chondogyo, right? which is very successful at raising money. Now, 
if you look at Christians, uh, Christian writings from the time, they didn't really like Chondogyo. You know, you know was founded in opposition to Christianity. So why did they ally? Why did they join forces this time? Well, what both had in common was that they were both critical of Neo-Confucianism. Especially its idea, uh, its rigid status hierarchies. They both held, held, had in common a uh, strong belief in human equality and getting rid of class distinctions. Uh, both also had very strong organizations that were useful for underground organizing. In fact, Chondogyo had been suppressed in the 19th century, so it was an underground religion for many of the first decades of its existence. And it, because it had to face such severe suppression, it developed lots of strategies for surviving, in fact, even thriving under those conditions. And Christianity was sort of similar, but the church provided, again, a very strong in institutional structure. In fact, churches were extremely tight-knit in those days. You know, those of you who are Korean-American, we, we, you know, we grew up hearing stories of churches who are constantly splitting because they can't get along. Right? It was opposite at this time. A church would form, when it grew to a certain size, it would deliberately split and then uh, form another, another church where a bunch of uh, members lived. So oh, this is how it, like, the, the Presbyterian church spread rapidly in, in Pyongyang, in North Korea, northern Korea. Right? There was one church that kept on splitting off to find other churches. Then those churches would grow and then split off. So every church in a, in a city or a town would be descended from a single church. This meant that the relations among them were extremely tight and most importantly, trusting. They could trust each other, that they wouldn't you know, betray each other while they're doing it at this secret organizing. Thirdly, another commonality was that they both supported uh, educating women. They both put tremendous importance on educating women. They felt that, uh, not that they were tremendous, necessarily tremendous supporters of women's liberation, but they felt that the education of children must be the charge of the mother, not the father. Therefore, mothers must be educated. So both devoted significant resources to educating women. And we see this is one reason why there's so many women involved in the March 1st movement. Now, another source of civil society strength was the rapid growth of modern education. You know, teachers and students at modern schools played prominent roles in organizing the protests. A lot of people you see in the front lines of the students were young students and their teachers, over and over again. And again, this was extremely rapid. You know, we, 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 think, we think of today as Koreans being very passionate about education, but uh, this proved true then as well. 1883 was the first school. A go the government formed a, a modern school to start spreading more Western-style modern education. 1885, the first mission schools were founded. Right? How rapid was it? Before 1910, you know, before the Japanese took over the country in 1910, Korea had a complete educational system from primary schools to colleges by that time. So basically, in, in 25 years, within 25 years, they built up a whole complete educational system. And these were closely connected with the religions of the time, especially Christian churches. Uh, almost every single Christian church had a primary school. And they also funded many other schools. Like many Christian schools were actually not mission schools. They were Christian schools formed by Christian believers, not by missionaries, but by Korean Christians themselves because they were interested in promoting modern education. Then through these places, they learned about modern forms of political action. And most of them lived in this school. So schools became hotbeds of organizing. Now, one further proof uh, about the strength of education and, and religions is the location of the protests. Right? People think of it as a nationwide movement, but it didn't really start that way. If you look at this map, the ones I have highlighted in green are the places where, the, where protests occurred on the day of March 1st, 1919. You can see, other than Seoul, they were all in the north, in the northwest. You know, we think of this area as, as being the area you know, where, where North Korea is, is communist country. But at this time, the northwest was where the growth of modern education and Christianity was the fastest. Right, remember, don't forget that Kim Il-sung's father was a Christian and went to a Christian mission school. 
Right? Right? There was very strong Christian groups in that area who were very politicized. Right? Now, of course, another major legacy of the March 1st movement is the development of Korean nationalism. Right? And the movement is generally seen as the outburst of an already existing nationalism. But for a historian, that's, that's not quite accurate. It would be more accurate to say that it marked a turning point in the development of Korean national identity. Right? And the last thing is, if you look at the, the word that Koreans use for the nation, so you know, minjo, the Chinese characters are here. Right? Minjo is, is used to refer to this, you know, this eternal Koreanness that's existed. But what people don't realize is that the use of this term minjok is actually very recent. Right? In fact, uh, the March 1st movement played a role in making its use more widespread. Right? The term was hardly used in the 1890s. Right? One of the most important newspapers at the time was the Dongnip Shimun, the Independent. It was the first vernacular newspaper in Korea. If you look at this, the number of times the word minjok appears in its pages is literally zero. Right? They use other terms, you know, gungmin, inmin, or, or baeksong. You know, these words that have very sort of an old flavor. If you watch Korean historical dramas, you're familiar with words like baeksong, or, or even dongpo. Right? They still are not using minjuk. That's a very modern way of thinking of identity. Right? But then, the term minjuk appears to have been first used in the year 1900. At least that's the earliest reference I've been able to he hear about. But then it began to increase from 1905. And if you look at the most important newspaper before the Japanese um, annexation, and this is the Dehan Meil Shimbo. This was very important because uh, they got a British journalist to be the legal owner of the newspaper, Ernest Bethel. This meant that the Japanese could not censor it and could not suppress it. So it became the center of sort of anti-Japanese uh, protests and criticism of the Japanese. Right? So it was fr free to, to write as, as they wished. But you can see even here, initially the use of the term minjok was very low. 1908, only seven instances. But suddenly it began to increase as the annexation came, came near, 1909-1910. So it's being used. Then next, we can see it much more in the actual Declaration of Independence. I don't know if you've actually seen this, but this is the actual printing of the original Declaration of Independence. And what's unusual is that here we see the word minjo for nation used a lot. It appears 13 times. It appears more often than the actual word for independence in the Declaration of Independence. So clearly, something has happened in those years. We don't have too many publications from the 1910s because of you know, Japanese suppression of the press. But clearly, something is shifting. Now, this, all, this demonstrates to us, again, the importance of modern print to modern nationalism. You know, those of you uh, who are studying this will be familiar with the work of Benedict Anderson, who studied the connection between print capitalism and nationalism. He observed that print capitalism made it possible for rapidly growing numbers of people to think about themselves and to relate themselves to others in profoundly new ways. So it's the ability of people all over country to read the same newspaper or the same novel at the same time altered their conceptions of time and space. So they became aware that uh, their existence is simultaneous with that of others reading the same newspaper. And this affects their sense of identity and eventually was called the nation. Koreans were very much aware of this connection. We see one evidence of this in An Jung-gun. An Jung, one of the most famous Koreans, you know, he's the assassin for, of Ito Hirobumi in Harbin in 1909. Now, according to one source, uh, at his trial you know, for the assassination, uh, he was, of course, a very you know, strong patriot. And he used the trial to continue to, instead of testify, just to continue to denounce the Japanese. So he listed 10 different crimes of Ito Hirobumi that justified his killing 
to him justified his killing of Ito. And you, you know, the, the ones you can see are serious, the things that the Japanese did in the late 19th century. You know, the assassination of Empress Min. You know, you know, and that was particularly brutal. They didn't just assassinate Empress Min. It, those of you who know the incident, remember, they poured uh, oil on her and burned her corpse to a crisp. Right? That. Uh, deposing Emperor Gojo, the dismantling of the Korean army, these are all serious. But the ninth one was prohibition of subscriptions to newspapers. You know, this looks like it doesn't belong with the others. But they felt that newspapers were so critical to Korean nationalism that it was justified for it to Anjung as a crime on the level of you know, murder and the other crimes listed here. Now, the growth of modern print was extremely rapid in the late 19th and early 20th century. And this illustrates another theme of Korean history, which is Koreans are great at adopting information technology. Right? You might think that this occurred only with the cell phone. Right? Remember when we went from dumb phones to smartphones, suddenly Korean companies emerged. But this has been, this has been a theme throughout Korean history. Remember, Koreans invented metal, metal type a century before the Europeans did. Right? If you line up you know, like the, the royal records of Joseon, you know, the Joseon was a dynasty that was just 500 years long. Right? If you line it up, it's actually, there's more documentary records than the entirety of Chinese official royal records. So Koreans were obsessive rec uh, note takers, record keepers. You know, we think of the Japanese sort of that way. They're obsessed with keeping information. But actually, if you look at traditional times, it's the Koreans. Right? During, the, during the Joseon period, they had three different sets of offices recording the, the events of the, of the monarch. They did everything in triplicate. Right? They, had, they, had a, they had a scribe constantly recording the king as well. Not only that, they had two scribes. In case one person missed it, the scribe did it. Then from the middle of the Joseon period, they made the king to keep his own diary, his own records. Yeah. Koreans are just obsessed with information. And this came true in the late 19th century as well. Right? When, as soon as they got their hands on the printing press, it spread extremely rapidly. Right? The first press they got was in 1883. The government imported a, press, a printing press to start its own newspaper, but this failed within a year. But then by the 1890s, when the, in, when the initiative for modern print spread to outside of the government to civil, this newly emerging civil society, it took off. So 1896, we have the first vernacular newspaper. 1898, the first daily newspaper. Right? By 1904, the Dan Mayo Shimbo has a circulation of 10,000. Of course, this doesn't capture the true circulation of newspapers at the time, because remember, most Koreans, you know, 80% of Koreans are illiterate at this time. So what was done with newspapers was that one person, the literate person in a village would get a subscription and just read it out loud to everyone in the village. Or a literate person would take it to a market and, or a magistrate would get a subscription and bring it to the market day and read it out loud. So a newspaper uh, reached far more people than the actual you know, uh, circulation. And this growth actually continued in the 1910s, even under J Japanese rule. Right? You can see a tremendous increase in the production of print over the course of the 1910s. And it's not surprising. These were among the first capitalist enterprises, right? among the first sort of you know, corporations or businesses in, in South Korea were newspapers and booksellers. Now, so this shows that, again, modern print appears to have taken hold in Korea sometime you know, right before the March 1st, about 1917, uh, when the first modern novel came out. Now, the new technologies of print, of course, transformed how people used text. You know, completely new textual practice. Just as you know, the smartphone has completely changed, you know, is, is changing the Korean language and the way people communicate. The printing press did too. So, and it was critical to the success of the March First Movement because, as you know, they printed out the Declaration of Independence and spread it all over. Not only that, uh, a lot of students. Uh, got primitive mimeograph machines and printed underground newspapers during the movement. In fact, they would break into offices, you know, government offices, steal their mimeograph machine and use it to print uh, you know, pamphlets and underground newspapers. Some of them who were probably a little naive, actually purchased mimeograph machines from Japanese 
businesses. And they were among, the, of course, the first people arrested. Because right? that's how the Japanese uh, decided, uh, found organizers. They went to the Japanese mimeograph companies and got their customer lists and went and arrested the people. Now, we can see uh, how pr uh, pr textual practices were in the process of being changed in the Declaration of Independence itself. Now, now how do they do this? Like, it had to be done in secret. Right? Now, there were two main companies that published the Declaration of Independence that was, uh, that was distributed in Seoul. One was Shin Mun Gua. This was formed by Chen Nam Sun. And Chen Nam Sun was the actual author of the Declaration of Independence. Right, as is well known. He was a pioneering poet, but he did this. Uh, Chen Nam Sun was, uh, was 17 years old in 1907 when he founded this company. Uh, you know, if, you're, if you're not, you know, uh, I was still in high school at 17 years old. He was founding you know, print companies at the age of 17. Right? He was very much illustrative of the trends of his time. He was from the Jungin class. He was not a young one, from the Jungin class. Right? So he's from a, you know, a minor elite class, and he used it to promote vernacular Korean. The other company behind the Declaration of Independence was Bo Song Sa. This was originally founded in 1905 by Yi Yong Ik, but it was taken over by the Chondogyo religion in 1910. So it became the religion's official publishing company. Right? They weren't terribly uh, large companies. You know, the capitalization, you can see it right there. You know, Bo Song Sa is not even 10,000 yen. Shin Mun Gwan is pretty large at, for a Korean company at 40,000 yen. But Japanese companies were well over 100,000 in this period. So Shin Mun Gwan was big for a Korean company, but hardly compared to the Japanese one. Now, the, Chen Nam Sun first wrote up the Declaration of Independence. He did it on scrap paper that he did to hide it. And since he was sort of under, he, knew, he thought he might be under observation, he wrote it in a place where he thought the police would never think of looking for him. He wrote it at the house of a Japanese friend. So unbelievable. He wrote it, the Korean Declaration of Independence was written at a Japanese person's house. But it was a, a Japanese person who was married to a Korean. So again, we have the incredible power of love <laughs> meant that the Japanese person did not betray <laughs> Chen Nong-sun. He just rented out a room there, wrote it on scrap paper in secret, and he hid it in jars of food in his house as he was doing this, right? Then he brought it to his company, Shin Mun Guan, to be typeset and, and printed it out. And they needed about 20,000 copies. So they somehow had to do this, without, make that many copies without being de detected. But the problem was that they made some, but then it broke. So then they went to Bo Song Sa and printed out the rest. But because of that, we have two different versions of the Declaration of Independence. So, this is the one from Shin Mun Guan, Chen Nam Sun's company. And this is the one from Bo Song Sa. I don't know if you notice, but these two look very different. Right? And you can tell the two apart because again, there's a spelling error in the Bo Song Sa's version. It spells the name of Korea wrong. It got the characters backwards. Right? I, why, why, why do you think there's such an error? It's because again, one, they had to do it in secret and very quickly. If there was a mistake, they had no time to fix it. Also, at this time, uh, especially this, uh, the, the Declaration of Independence is sort of written in a, very, a little bit of an older style very, and uses very difficult language and difficult characters. So if the author was not there to correct the text, it wouldn't have been corrected. So they just printed out quickly, the mistake survives. Mistake. But what's different is, you see this here. It's written in sort of mixed script in Korean, but it's a very old style, you know, top down, but also no breaks in between the words. But if you look at the Shimun one, one, it looks much more modern. There's breaks between the words, in what Koreans call diosugi. Right? It looks like they're sort of paragraphs. It's written in a more, much more modern style. So in the two different versions of the Declaration of Independence, we see this transformation from, again, an older traditional style of writing to the beginnings of a modern style of writing. Right? And the March 1st movement occurred at this, was at a turning point in this. Question? Right. Yeah. How many copies of these were not collected? 
uh, there's a, a decent number because the, the Japanese took a whole bunch and used it for their trials. But also then, uh, as people took it out to the countryside, people would use mimeograph machines to make more in the countryside. So there's more sort of rougher versions of it in, in, in the countryside as well. But in terms of these two are the only sort of official ones that were distributed on that day of March 1st. Now, it might be worthwhile thinking about uh, what does the March 1st movement tell us about Korean nationalism, especially uh, in the text of the Declaration of Independence itself? I know if you're a Korean of a certain age, you were made to memorize it in school. And that was very painful because the Declaration of Independence is actually quite long for a Declaration of Independence. The Americans were much shorter. Right? Reading this takes a good, can take anything from seven to 10 minutes because it's a very long text. Right? But it's worth looking over. And uh, in fact, because certain people uh, seem to misunderstand the Declaration, the author himself in 1955, tried to write an explanation of his intentions of the, uh, of the Declaration. And because he thought that they were misunderstanding what his conception of nationalism. Now, if you read the very beginning of the Declaration, it talks about how Koreans have been independent for centuries. You know, ever since its beginning, thousands of years, Korea is an independent country. Now, Chen Namsa later explained that. He did this. He was, he was asserting Korea's independence, not from Japan, but from China. He said it was very important at that time to clarify that Korea was always independent from China. Right? This was not because of the Chinese, but because of Japan. This was still directed at Japan, because Japan was claiming that Korea's relationship with China as subordinate justified Japan's takeover of Korea. But he wanted to, as he says here, he wanted to fundamentally reject that, that, that view, that Korea had always been independent of China in the past. Second, sorry, the Korean was so long I couldn't, I couldn't fit in a uh, translation here, but he wanted to make clear in the Declaration of Independence that Korean nationalism is not a matter of anti-Japanese sentiment. So he says, anti you know, he said, it's not coming out of anti-Japanese spirit or any type of exclusive, sense of exclusiveness. You know, he wanted Korean nationalism to be much more inclusive, open. You know, he was worried that, even at that time, Koreans were confusing patriotism with anti-Japanese sentiment. He felt that Korean nationalism was something bigger than that. Yes, Japan just happened to be the obstacle to Korea fulfilling its historical development. And that the idea of fulfilling its historical development, that's nationalism, not opposing the Japanese. Now, we can see this in the way the March 1st movement was celebrated even during the colonial period. Right? And we have some records of uh, you know, of course, it was almost impossible to celebrate the March 1st movement within Korea under Japanese rule. But the exiled Koreans did. And since they produced newspapers and took photographs, we have records of how exiled Korean communities celebrated the March 1st movement. And this is one independence activist who later wrote a memoir. And he said that the March 1st movement was the happiest day of the year, even better than Christmas and better than New Year's. Right. This is a photograph of the very first celebration of the March 1st movement in, in Shanghai in 1920. A little so clear that you can see the Chinese characters for, you know, you know, Korean independence and manze in the background. You can see the flags. Uh, you, can, you can see the pho photograph of the next year, 1921, is better. Okay. You can see it says memorial, memorial, uh, uh, you know, commemorating the Korean uh, proclamation of Korean independence. It says Dehan Mingo in their Chinese characters. Right? It's a sense of the size of the event. About 700 people attended the event at that time, which is, which is probably well over 50% of the Korean community at that time. But it was not only Koreans. Now, all Chinese sent representatives every single year. And that's not surprising because Korean national independence activists and Chinese activists were working together at the time. Right? You can see the flags of the world are up there. Of course, the only flag that's missing is Japan's. 
right? They deliberately left it out there. Right? You can see how they're dressed. You know, West, you know, surprisingly, not too many people are dressed in hanbok. It would have been very difficult for them to acquire this yeah, uh, in China uh, at the time. Now, what would they do? Uh, this is actually uh, one of two ceremonies they held on that day. They would hold two separate ceremonies. So the Korean provisional government would hold its own official ceremony in the morning. Then at 2 p.m., the Korean community will hold their own event. You know, why 2 p.m.? Because that's when the Declaration of Independence was read on March 1st. So they're recreating that, that moment. Both events would have speakers. You know, you know, famous independence activists would gather, give, 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 give speeches. And then they would have singing, a recitation of the Declaration of Independence. Then at the end, they would remove the banners that you see in the front and the flags, place them on cars, then drive the cars through the Japanese residential areas of Shanghai. Right? Then they would end in front of the Japanese legation and protest, and you're protesting. Right? Now, and over the course of the 1920s, we see that the celebration of the March 1st movement, movement became much more international. So representatives from other colonial regions would join. So India, Vietnam, Taiwan, Mongolia. So they were very much interested in forming a sort of a pan-Asian coalition of colonial peoples and using that event to promote that. So again, it was much more of an open nationalism than an exclusivist na nationalism. Right. Now, one other thing that I, I learned about the March 1st celebrations when I, when I read sources on it, it was supposed to be fun. Right? March 1st was not, like, it was not supposed to be a solemn occasion. It was supposed to be a celebration. Right? It was the day that gave Koreans hope. And they, they, they felt that they achieved their independence. So it was meant to be a happy occasion. So as you can see here, this is a photograph of the, uh, of the musical bands that performed. At that. And there was always some sort of musical performance when they were able to hold the celebration. You can see they're dressed, you know, some of them are dressed in Chinese clothes and otherwise Western clothes. This is when the provisional government had moved to Changsha at this time. Why is, this, why is it that way? He said that, again, in a memoir, this person, Kim Young soon said, the lonely exiles who did not have the opportunity to laugh seemed to wait all year for the fun they had on this one evening. So Koreans partied hard on March 1st. Right. Remember, uh, there were no other celebrations at this time. There weren't that many Christi uh, Christians at the time, no Christmas, there was no, there was no Gwangbokjo, no, no other holidays. This was it. This was their happy day. So if you looked at the 100th anniversary celebrations in South Korea last year, right, it might have been strange to you that you know, there's all this solemn, uh, ceremony going on. And suddenly in the middle, there's a rap performance by the rapper B.Y. And the official South Korean government performance about this. Right? It might seem strange, but again, it's actually in keeping with how they celebrated the March 1st movement all these years. That there was actually, it was a joyous celebration was part of it as well. Now, another legacy of the March 1st movement, you know, one that's generally sort of been ignored and has been sort of elusive is the emergence of ideological splits. And you don't hear you know, publicly, in, in the public discourse, much talk about this. You know, it's commonly asserted that the movement united the Korean people. But uh, this was true to a certain extent, but actually what happened just a few years after the March 1st movement was ideological splits. It became extremely severe very quickly. Right. So looking at the March 1st movement can help us to understand not, not just Korean nationalism, but the, the division of the country. So why after supposedly the most, one of the most unifying events of Korean history, of modern Korean history, why did that just three years after the event did ideological splits began to emerge? And did over a seemingly sort of uh, a not directly relevant event, an old Confucianist called Kim Yun-shik passed away. Then the newspaper, Dongai Ilbo, suggested uh, holding a public funeral for him. And this, this enraged socialists, and they organized a boycott of the Dongai Ilbo newspaper. So this was the very first time that the 
ideological differences between nationalists and socialists became explicit. Right? And this developed fairly quickly. By 1924, among student groups and among sort of social movements, socialists generally had the upper hand. They had the leadership position in most of the important uh, organizations already by that time. And in 1925, we have the formation of the first you know, Communist Party. Uh, not, I mean, first Communist Party and the one that was the first Communist Party recognized by the Soviet Union. You know, the Koreans had set a Communist Party since you know, 1919. But the first official one was in 1925. So in other words, the March 1st movement also stimulated the rise of socialism. So how does something so seemingly so nationalist in orientation also promote you know, revolutionary socialism at the same time? And there's a couple of reasons for this. First was it, it heightened people's sense of disillusionment toward the West. You know, the failure of the Versailles Peace Conference to take up Korea's issue and to not even allow the delegate to attend disillusioned a whole generation of young people and it made them question the validity of the Western model of development. And World War I itself made them, already had made them skeptical of Western claims of civil, to be more civilized. So rather than bringing civilization and peace, they saw the West as engaging only in barbarity and war. Let me see this quote from Song, the book Song of Arirang. The shock of the betrayal from Versailles that came a few weeks later was so great that I felt as though the heart had been torn out of me. So this is a book written by Nim Wales, whose real name was Helen Foster Snow. You might be more familiar with her husband, Edgar Snow, a journalist. He's famous because he was the first Western journalist to cross lines and to interview Mao. And he later wrote the book Red Star Over China. So his wife, you know, Helen Foster Snow accompanied him. Then when she was living with the Chinese communist, she ran into a Korean communist. And he told her his life story that she wrote as Song of Arirang. That's why we have this record. Now, second aspect uh, that is revealed in this text is, is uh, the, that the March 1st movement led to the rise of mass movements. You know, from that movement, that movement onward, all politics were about mass politics. So it completely changed the politics of the country. And Kim San uh, observed this as well. The March 1st movement was my first awakening to political consciousness. And the power of mass movement shook me to the very roots of my being. So I had many shocks during those few days. It was like living through an earthquake. I learned the meaning of force and the futility of non-resistance. So on the one hand, it made the March 1st movement the Versailles made people disillusioned with the West, but then the March 1st movement gave them hope through the power of mass movements. So it was only one step from there from becoming interested in revolution as an alternative model of modernization. Now, another aspect of this, a third reason is that the that young people became very disillusioned with the leadership of the nationalist movement at this time. We can see this in the diary of uh, a leader of the Methodist church at the time, Yun Chi Ho. Right? He himself was opposed to the March 1st movement. He thought it was foolish to resist the Japanese. You know, he wrote on this. He even called uh, Japanese, uh, people in the Japanese government saying, I told them how sincerely I am opposed to the agitation. And another uh, Methodist Christian at the time, Shin Hung Wu, was very much opposed to it. And this enraged the students. He said, the students are literally gnashing their teeth against Shin Hung Wu. These two cautioned me to be careful as the agitators are, and I like this phrase, yoking me for not participating in the movement. So they're cursing him out for not pr participating in the movement. Yeah. We see this repeatedly. You know, Yun Chi Ho was the head of the, of the Seoul YMCA at the time. And he says that the Koreans public seems to be much offended by my frank statements of the reasons why I've refused to join the movement. The young men in the YMCA building itself showed decided coolness toward me. Oops, sorry. So, and there was much evidence that during this time, this general re refusal to accept authority was sort of generalized at this time. You see this entry, this is all the way from 1926. 
He said that the graduate wedding class of Gyeongshin Hakyu invited their teachers to a Thanksgiving feast, and in the midst of eating, the boys took out clubs and mauled the teachers. This is in a Christian mission school. Right? If there's any NYU undergraduates here, don't get any ideas uh, about this. But Gyeongshin Hakyu, you might not be familiar with it, but part of Gyeongshin Hakyu was used to create the precursor to Yonsei University. Right? So, so this is not just some, some uh, marginal school. This is an, an important school. Korea. But again, there's just a generalized feeling of, again, again that, that you know, it might be sort of like how the 1960s were in Korea. We won't accept the authority of our elders, and we will rebel against them. I think all of these factors contributed to, again, uh, rejection of nationalism. Even as the March 1st movement developed, you know, demonstrated the strength of nationalism, there were just as strong reasons to reject it. Now, it's important that Koreans themselves were sort of aware of this at the time. Right? Koreans, you know, in the 1920s, were not going, oh, you know, we're, you know nationalism is so strong. They, not, they were actually extremely worried about nationalism at the time. Now, and so it's interesting to look at how Koreans wrote about the movement itself. Now, though there were diverse reactions, some common themes do emerge. You know, many people expressed a sense of confusion or a sense of incompleteness about it. This is from uh, the Dongai Ilbo. He said that from the time of the March 1st movement, our nation has tr truly started taking the first steps to revile. Okay, so the March 1st movement was just a beginning to that. That needed to be completed later. Chen Amson, again, the author of the Declaration of Independence, in 1922, he wrote, it is true that we now have a great national awakening. However, that awakening is still in great confusion. So and he didn't feel that you know, Korean nationalism was set. It was still a very confusing time toward him. By 1925, the, uh, an editorial in the newspaper, Dong Ilbo, expressed it this way. Uh, Korea now is in a state of ideological anarchy. So again, they did not feel that nationalism is dominant. They felt that, again, it's, so it's weak, it's some, there's some, still some, some confusion going on. So these are not socialists who are writing, these are all nationalist writers who are writing this. And even into, and, but of course Marxists shared their views. Even into the 1930s, Marxists were saying that you know, we are divided into right and left, but the foundation for both right and left is weak. So he felt that the foundation for both nationalism and socialism was weak, or weaker than it should be. That was their ideological reaction to the March 1st movement. Not that it was a strong assertion of nationalism, that there were certain dilemmas of, of nationalism and socialism that they had to face at that time. So these quotes capture aspects of the March 1st movement that can be elusive, but are sometimes forgotten. That is, the movement did express a strong desire, a strong sense of Korean nationalism. But at the same time, that nationalism was not strong enough to prevent ideological splits. So the movement provided hope, but also left them with an almost overwhelming sense of how much was left to achieve. You know, the Koreans, exiled Koreans, you know, reminded themselves of this every year. Because they, they celebrated not only March 1st, but they also celebrated August 29th. Right? Do you know what happened on August 29th? That's the day the Japanese took over Korea. They actually celebrated that day to remind themselves that, you know, of how much Korean nationalism have, has still had to achieve. So it might be better to, to understand the March 1st movement, not as a movement or a revolution, but as an incomplete revolution or a failed revolution. In fact, modern Korean history can be seen as the effort to sort of complete this incomplete task. Right? Uh, a professor in Hyung Tech has come up with an interesting sort of phrase to describe this situation. He talks about the debt that modern Korea owes to March 1st. Right? Is that March 1st sort of set the ideals for modern Korean history. That Korea still to this day has not fulfilled because it remains a, a divided country. So he said, you know, a lot of people talk about the spirit of the March 1st movement. 
But for him, that spirit means not just asserting Korean nationalism, but somehow working toward overcoming the division of the country. Right? And we can see this test even in celebrations of the March 1st movement after Korea was liberated. I told you at the beginning of the talk that the first celebration of, of March 1st after liberation was in 1946. Right? So March 1st, 1946, they held it. But of course, uh, there were actually two events held that day, one by nationalists and one by socialists. Right? They couldn't agree on a single event. That's how severe the division was between them. And the following year, in 1947, they held two, two separate events again, then riots broke out between the two sides. On the day meant to celebrate Korean unity, <laughs> nationalists and socialists were riot rioting on the streets of Seoul. So this is what you know, uh, contemporary co commentators are referring to when they talk about, again, okay, the death of the March 1st movement. It's to sort of, sort of find a way for March 1st movement to actually express a true uh, unity of the Korean people. Right? This doesn't happen because, as you know, North Korea does not celebrate March 1st. Right? Uh, after Trump's initiative began with Kim Jong-un, you know, South Korean president met with Kim Jong-un. And he, the South Korean president actually proposed holding a joint celebration of the March 1st movement to Kim Jong-un. But he never heard back. Right? North Korea had, did not want to celebrate March 1st at all. So to the state, the, the March 1st movement, unfortunately, the legacy of the March 1st movement still evokes the division of the country more than unity. Okay. So it's interesting to see what happens to this in future years. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>